All right, so we are on your family, fortifying the lives of those you love. If I was your enemy, I'd seek to disintegrate your family and destroy every member of it. I'd want to tear away at your trust and unity and turn everyone's love inward on themselves. I will make sure your family didn't look anything like it's supposed to look. Because then people will look at your Christian marriage, your Christian kids, and you're no different, no stronger than anybody else. That God underneath it all really doesn't change anything. My husband Jerry and I, we both readily admit, had a terrible second year of marriage. We fought early and often, long and hard. Two people so young with so little in the bank of shared experiences with which to accumulate which much ammunition. Yet we still seem to find plenty of it to go into battle with and battle we did against each other all the time. But we made it through by the skin of our gritted teeth and the tough patches we endured once we settled back down only to seem to make us better and closer, more committed, more complete. Now 14 years later, three kids later, we seem to be fully hitting our stride as a family of five. We still had stuff to do with, of course, like everybody else does, to deal with but for the most part all good and happy then came last year with my family's blessings i'd accepted much to even my own surprise a part in a major faith-based film film i was shocked to be invited to participate shocked that i was willing to risk saying yes and shocked even more after the director saw my acting abilities that they still wanted me to take the role took me about as far out of my comfort zone as this girl had been in a long time long time maybe ever the movie as you probably know by now is on the theme of prayer the power of strategic prayer the kind of prayer power God can activate in his people and specifically the kind of prayer that can rescue a family before it careens off a cliff of near certain destructions the directors of the film began uh, wrote me a long email before shooting began they filled me in on details to help me prepare for what was ahead and among their many notes was a warning they wanted to make me aware of Satan's penchant for targeting the people who'd been involved in their previous fams. Wow. And how he'd taken aim at their areas of their personal lives that were connected to the message of this movie. Since this particular project was on the theme of prayer and family, they encouraged me to be vigilant about praying for my own family, praying against any assignments the enemy may have trained against us. Soon summer arrived and we packed our bags and moved to another state to begin a couple months of filming. I was the novice on set, didn't know what to expect as far as all the acting and directing and movie making that was involved, but even having been forewarned, I didn't fully realize how that summer of on-site shooting would affect some of the dynamics in my family. Gosh, we were just having fun in our new surroundings, soaking up all the fresh adventure of it, not really thinking about the unique set of stressors placed on all of us. Being away from home, out of our element, out of our usual rhythms, but pretty soon the slightest things would set off a disagreement, a misunderstanding, hot feelings, and short fuse. And by the time we made it through our final wrap on the film set, we were exhausted, not physically, but relationally. Okay, freeze here. Get this picture of what has happening, what was happening in our family at the time and how it contrasted with the message of the movie we were involved in portraying. Can't you see the enemy's strategy at work? Of course, he would want to turn up the background noise to try to complicate in the work we were doing to in expressing God's truth for a global audience. Of course, he would want, if possible, to water down this important message by dismantling the relationships of the people participating in it, just as we'd been told to expect. So since we knew who was behind the tension, we made the deliberate choice to stop fighting with each other and to fight instead with the doggone enemy. We vigilantly asked God to make our marriage and family and the families of all those involved in the film bulletproof against those incessant attacks. Now, that's, this is so good because they knew, number one, because they were warned of what would happen with them even being involved in this movie. Um, that the devil was going to come after them. And number two, what was really good was that the husband, you know, was a Christian too, or he was a godly man. And so they were both able to come. It might be a little bit different if your, your spouse is not, you know, if he don't know what's going on. But I like that they both stood against 
the enemy and they knew what was wrong and they're like, wait a minute, it's not you. It's not you. It is it's the enemy. So I do like that they saw that. It says too much was at stake and it was a big deal. But you know what? It's always a big deal. All of our marriage and families are a big deal. Yours and mine. They're all that big of a deal because each one is a billboard for the eternal, unchangeable love story between God and humankind. Each of their successes or failures is of great importance, both in God's eyes and therefore in our enemy's eyes. So he targets them, all of them. He targets our roles as wives, targets our husbands. He targets our children. He brings dissension, infuses tension unravels our sense of peace with disunity because ultimately he wants to destroy our families all of our families so that the billboard message they're designed to project to the world is a picture that is at best laughable you know how many times have people said oh you see like this because he thinks it's funny like he wants to put people who are godly men and women on blast. He wants us to be the ones for our marriage to break up or how many times have, you know, a big preacher or something cheated on their wife or have other children or like he loves, he lives for that type of stuff. He wants your marriage. He wants your children. Like this is, this is the devil at his best. It says now if you're a single woman thinking you might just flip ahead to the next chapter, since this one doesn't apply to you, Think again. There's more that pertains to you on this subject matter than you may realize. We're all a part of it, married or not, or just not married yet. We need everybody praying, even for a marriage and family like yours that may be still to come in the future. Here's why. According to scripture, the number one purpose of marriage, more than even the unique time-honored partnership it creates between a man and a woman, more than even conceiving and raising of children, more than any prince charming fairy tale in any little girl's head is how we represent the mystery of the gospel in active living form. That's what a beloved professor of mine, Dr. Dwight Pentecost, who'd also been a professor to my father decades earlier, said to Jerry and me in a typewritten letter that I still tre treasure in a keepsake box of wedding memories. I scarcely need remind you, he wrote, that marriage was not in that marriage was instituted by God to be an object lesson to the world of the relationship of a believer to himself. Now, each of you will play a significant role in living out this lesson. A man chooses his bride. He loves her. He makes a covenant covenant with her and gives himself completely to her. And the woman responds by receiving his love, surrendering to him entering into the covenant bond with him and becoming one flesh with him. It's not a perfect representation, of course, since the best marriage we can possibly make on earth still involves a pair of fallen, broken people. But in its deepest sense, as, at its deepest level, this primarily human relationship between husband and wife is meant to be a living witness to others of the love of Christ for his church, which is Ephesians 5 and 22 and 33. So I'm gonna stop right there for just for one second because that's so important you guys i don't know if you heard my testimony in the first um in the first video that i did where i talked about how i was divorced before i think i talked about it a little bit but i was i've been married to my husband uh for 20 22 years or something like that now but um we got divorced after i think it was after nine years or after 10 years or something like that and we we divorced and we were separated for like a, a year we divorced for a year and then we got back together again but one thing number one i was young he he was younger but he's still older than me but i was young when i got married i was 20 years old and so i didn't really know a lot about being a wife but it's really important here where he talks about he wants us to be one and a lot of times when people get into marriage it feels almost like this is you you you're your own person you know of course you're your own person but you know it's like you're separate and i always think about it like this like when we got married the second time it was about we became one and it was about you know i'm not going to try to hit you below the belt i'm not going to say things to you that's really going to hurt you because it's ultimately hurt me why would i want to see my husband upset why would my husband want to see me upset so that's something that you really have to understand is that we're supposed to be one with our husband. It's not a competition. We're not trying to hurt them. You know, we're supposed to be one. Like, okay, fight with the kids, do whatever with the kids, but your husband and you should be on the same side. 
And that's what the Bible says here. It says marriage stands for the creation of unity among two people who were once separated in every way before love reached out and found the other. The way God reached out and found us and covenant with us and loved us. And despite who we are, despite what we're like, he still loves us. And this image more than almost anything is exactly what the enemy wants to den den denigrate. When scripture counsels husbands to love and lead their wives, even when it counsels us wives to submit to our husbands. And then it says go. The ultimate motivation for the is not just so we'll get along better on the weekends, but that our homes will reflect on earth the order of God's relationship with us. Husbands are to love their wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now that's Ephesians 5 and 25. And then it says wives are to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. And that's verse 24. Again, big deal all around, much bigger than we even thought. So when you and I begin feeling pressure and tension and splintering and conflict at home, when little trifling things start bunching together to become this one big thing, when the nitpicking turns into bickering, the bickering turns into outbursts, the outburst turns into rude, below the belt, unkindness and bitterness, the bitterness into slow seething pullbacks of silence and isolation. Is it just your husband being terrible, acting awful? Or is it just you being overly sensitive, slow to relinquish a foothold of cherished, hard fought ground? Is it just your child pulling away into isolation or overt rebellion? Is it just all of you going to your own rooms, disconnected, disjointed, fragmented? No, it bears all the marks of an enemy, an outside enemy, one who hangs around your family, but isn't a part of your family. He's the one who wants your marriage to suffer. He's the one who wants your home to be a dueling battleground. He's the one who's most invested in sending each of you out the door every day, vulnerable and susceptible to temptation, needed for the unconditional love and acceptance you're supposed to be giving and receiving from each other. Isn't that something? But we don't even think that it is the enemy. We don't even think that it is the devil that has a foothold in our family that has that 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 the devil will use who he can to break up any single thing that he can. It says, but he's the one on the receiving end of your frustration. Is he the one that's splattering your juicy comeback spoken with disgust against the inside glass of your windshield while you're driving down the road, rehearsing the scripts for your next occasion? Because the fact is, he's most likely the one who's pulled the wool over your eyes fooling you with the crafty bait and switch, leading you to focus all your indignation on the man or your kid instead. Isn't that something? Bad? He wants you miserable and exhausted and joyless and undone. He wants that picture of the gospel, the one you call your marriage and your family. He wants it tarnished and ripped up, smeared in the mud of failure, held up as a fresh meat from the kill, turning you against each other and tearing everybody in half. And as much as the father loves and embodies unity, your enemy loves and embodies division. Wherever discord is present, He's never too far away. Y'all underline that line in y'all book. Write it down. Put it in your war binder and say it over and over. Whenever discord is present, he's never too far away. So the moment discord begins to happen in, in your life, in your house, y'all need to get y'all war binders out, pull those scriptures out and say, devil, I see and I know you in the name of Jesus. And just begin to pray and get that spirit away. I, I even see it like I, I sometimes... I can be at church. My husband works on Sunday sometimes and, and I'll come home from church like in a good mood. And next thing you know, I come home. Some Sundays, my husband work, come home and just you could just see the whole atmosphere in my house. And I would just immediately just go into prayer because that's what the devil wants. He comes to steal, kill and destroy. And so immediately I will begin to pray and change that atmosphere and change things in my house because that's exactly what the devil wants. It says, and as most of us sadly know from fire, too much personal experience, no wounds cut as deep or cleave us at the core of our existence more than one wounds that we receive at the hands of our family. That is so true. Like you don't forget some things you say, you can move on some things from family, from, from your husband or your wife or your children, or some words is just, it just is hurt. And even though you move on, it's still, it's still there. It says you better believe he wants a piece of that action, but maybe he wasn't counting on this, a woman who'd had enough, 
enough to start taking some prayer action for her marriage, for her husband, and for her children, and for all her family. Y'all, this is awesome that you're even watching the video. The fact that you're even beginning to get started with this. The devil is not very happy. Get ready. Get your stuff together. Because listen, he's going to come after you. He will. Because he's not very happy right now. But you know what? You're willing to step up. Get your things in order and say, all right, here we go. So it says, here we go. This is it. Bring your family issues right up to the line here. And let's get some stuff out in the open. Let's get specific. Put a bead on the bull's eye where the real source of your family strife and discomfort and unmet needs are originating from. So we're going to find out. We look, we're getting ready to put exactly where it's coming from. It says, and let's show him the kind of resistance that a steady dose of prayer is able to exact against his demolition plans. Is it your marriage? Then quit trying to be the Holy Spirit in your relationship, responsible for poking and prodding that your husband of yours until he finally see things the way you want to see him the same way. I'll admit I spent some of my first years as a married woman convincing that my primary spiritual gift in life was to change Jerry in Jesus name. <laughs> this is good because this is how it was in my first marriage too. You can't change nobody. I said all the time, you can't change your husband. You can't change your children. You can't, you can pray against the situation, but you can't change them. It's taken me nearly two decades to begin realizing I was wrong. Changing Jerry, as it turns out, is not my spiritual gift. Nowhere in 1 Corinthians 12 or anywhere else in the scriptures where the divinely infused gifts of God's spirit are listed, does it say improving thy husband? <laughs> appear or is even footnoted in, footnoted in a selection and if we didn't know this to be the case from its obvious absence among the catalog of spiritual gifts haven't we all discovered from exhausting experience that the holy spirit all by himself can do a much better job of it than we we could right no it's not our job it's not my job and it's not your job to change that man but to respect him and then leave the rest to the lord Let's say that again together. Our job is to respect him and leave the rest to the Lord. Right? When you do this, you're not letting him off the hook at all. You're just leaving it to God. You're also well on your way to discovering something else. He's likely not the only one who needs to do some changing. In fact, he probably isn't the only one at my house at least who needs changing the most. The more you pray for your husband, the more the spirit will shine a spotlight on the places in your own heart and actions that need a bit of work as well. Come on, y'all. I like this book. It's really, it's getting, getting real. It says the only effective way to fight in marriage is to pray. The way to see the real truth behind whatever's happening in this whole situation of yours is to pray. Okay. The way to get the wheels moving again and have clogged up or perhaps totally come off is to pray. Prayer is how we isolate the real problems and prayer is how we get up behind those problems and attack them at the roots. It's how we isolate the real enemy. It's how we keep him on his heels and off our man. And prayer is also how God gets through to us even while we're praying for our husbands, convincing us that maybe what our husband needs most right now is for his wife to become soft, safe place for him to land rather than a prickly nagging source of contention contention that only agitates him and make things worse now i will say too i went to um mayor i went to we went to marital counseling as well and one thing that the counselor was saying was that don't keep don't keep nagging because i used to nag all the time we'll do it now we'll do it now we'll do it now and then my husband would just blow up and just start yelling and uh, you know and uh, he said, it's kind of like, you know, how you got like a beat, a zzz, 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 like right by you, just keep picking, 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 picking. And all of a sudden you're eventually going to snap. So he was like, don't do that. You know, men are built differently than us. So we can't, when we want to talk, we think we need to talk right now. Let's sit down. Let's talk right now. It don't always work like that. A man don't always want to talk. A man don't always want to sit down. And we have to respect that of him. It says, so even if things are going pretty well for you right now, even if you don't have a lot to complain about or feel upset over, the enemy, he's still there. Whether in full on attack mode or lurking and wait for the next possible opportunity to infiltrate. So pray and pray fervently. Is it your children? 
The Bible says our children are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. Wow. Psalms 127 and 4. We raise them up to shoot them into the culture, bearing the image of Christ to the world. Sounds again then like a place that would qualify as a major area of concern for an enemy who, who doesn't want any vestige of Christian valor and virtue running loose out there where. I don't know. They might take bold stands of faith and influence around their college friends, might pastor a church or run a business or become involved in mission and ministry opportunities that op that honor Christ and actively serve hundreds of people. But worst of all, they might marry and raise up a whole another generation of little Christ like followers, keeping your family burning red hot on an enemy radar long beyond your lifetime, spinning up a legacy of faith that spirals for undaunted into the future. Your enemy can't be having any of that now, can he? So don't be surprised when he start coming after your kids. And don't think it's all because they're being headstrong or peer dependent or careless or just lazy. Satan knows the parts of their character, both their strengths and their weakness, where he can worm in and try stunting their growth, their potential and their confidence. One of my sons, for example, has always been prone towards fear and anxiety. And ever since he was a small child, he's shown a noticeable bent towards this kind of emotional response to external stimuli. Knowing this, spotting this, I've been very specific in praying for him out loud over him. Even when he was just a baby, I've routinely asked the Holy Spirit to instill in courage within him to be a wall of protection against the enemy's attempts to exploit my son in the sensitive area. Three or four years ago, night after night, he started seeing something he described as a man in his room. Couldn't really be a man there, of course. The outside doors and windows were locked. Nobody was getting inside. Part of me wanted to write it off as nothing, tell him to go back to bed and just don't worry about it. But he was able to tell me in rather striking detail what this man looked like, where he was standing in relation to my son's bed, how paralyzing it felt when he sensed his presence in his room, as if a heavy blanket had fallen on him, suffocating him. That did it. I started to pray over him even more specifically, to pray over the room while the boys were away, to command the spirit of fear to leave my son's room, to leave him alone in the name of Jesus. And one day in particular, when this issue seemed to be reaching of a climax of intensity, I stormed into that bedroom like a rocket. I paced the floor, I quoted the scripture, I posted passages on the wall, I laid hands on the doorposts and the window ledges. And I'm not joking here, that was the last day my boy ever mentioned that band. As far as I know, he's never even been bothered by it since to that degree or by the precise way. That's good, so it was like a spirit. And this is giving me ideas for my home as well uh, over my children. This is really good, you guys. Um, so it was a spirit. It says, let the enemy run roughshed over my kids. No way. And I have a strong feeling that you won't allow him to do it to yours neither. No. An enemy is after your children. And I'm telling you, believe it, know it. But most important, deal with it. By tunneling deep into your prayer closet and fighting back with every parental and spiritual weapon at your disposal. Is it an issue with your other family members? Perhaps your most pressing family issues right now don't pertain to your husband and don't pertain to your children, but to other members of your extended family who are unsaved, feeling the brunt of the enemy attack on themselves or who are participating intentionally or unintentionally with the enemy's designs on, on you as their daughter, their sister, their cousin, their daughter-in-law, whatever. The forms that these source of conflict can take are as numerous as the number of people involved in them but just as much as the devil loves stirring up trouble in churches he loves stirring up trouble in the families he knows it's a christian witness killer an energy zapper a time eater a relationship destroyer the amount of senseless hurt and distraction he can cause per square inch in your family is one of the most desirable economies of scale he can do more damage with less effort by attacking us here within these relationships than any other context. But if they're wise, we can use his own geometry against him. Putting prayer into effect in places where we're close enough to touch the very people involved. Then as God's spirit does his work in us and in the situations, the others in our family will be standing close enough to watch it all happen in real time to see the kinds of change and impact our prayers are able to accomplish. Again, if you're a single woman, don't think this chapter doesn't apply to you. If you're wise, you'll discern that it most certainly does. Praying for your mate shouldn't begin 
when you walk down the aisle, it should start now before you've even been on your first date or even know the man's name. Pray for the man of God may be positioning as your future husband. Pray that he'll be set ablaze with love for Christ and a heart for leading you well and making your marriage a devoted priority. Pray that God will guard his friendships and those who will influence the path he has taken even right now. Pray that his passions will be attuned with authentic faith and his, his purity will be a matter of co deep commitment and that God will superintend the um, circumstances that bring the two of you together all in his perfect plan and his perfect timing. And if you don't have any children of your own, then you pray for the little ones, your nieces, your nephews and your neighbors who are in your life and whom God brings specifically to your attention. And yes, begin praying for the child or children. He may entrust you at a later time, though whatever means he leads you to take. I once knew a guy who began setting aside $100 a month for his children when he was in his mid-20s. And he didn't even marry until he was in his early 30s. He was preparing a nest of security in advance for his child to be born into. Prayer allows you to do the same thing in the spiritual realm. To prepare an environment of spiritual security and the first stirring of a family legacy before your child is even stirring in the womb. Can you imagine that a gift it could be years from now for your children to see your handwritten fervent prayers for them before they even took their first breath? The family is one of the key access points of God's purposes on earth and your family at the point of your sphere of your influence is a major component of what he is doing right here with you with you live in order to make sure you're fully cooperating with him and with enormous opportunity embodying your family structure and his people they need you to not be on their backs not to be up on their faces but to be down on your knees now assume a new fighting position okay a call to prayer if for some reason you've only been skimming through these early chapters so far not really stopping to turn to the pages of the back of the book and formulate your own prayer strategies for praying against Satan's attack on your patient, your passion, your focus, and your identity. I hope this will be the place where you really do take the time to pull off the side, break away um, from just trying to finish another book that you started, and spend some concentrated effort in crafting specific, strategic, personalized prayer approaches for your family person by person and name by name. You guys take some time with us. Don't rush through this because this is so important because this really is something that the devil attacks. Take time out of your day and do this. Do this strategy, you guys. It's so important. It says the stakes are simply too high not to do it. I think we've all resorted at one time or another to the roll call system for co covering our family in prayer. Lord bless my husband, Lord bless my kids, be with my aunt and uncle in Ohio, be with my dad in his knee replacement rehab, be with my brother who's looking for work, quick, easy, over and done. Better than totally ignoring them perhaps, but hardly a satisfying confidence that you're going all out participating mightily with God in their future, their provision or their rescue. Beloved, the apostle John wrote, I pray that in all respects, you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. May he give you your heart, your heart, your desires and fulfill your whole purpose. The scripture is full of eternal um, truths made more relevant when framed against the context of your family life, specific needs and dilemmas. These are verses and counsels related to how a wife treats, blesses, thinks about and responds to her husbands. Pray for them. So I'm not going to go over all the scriptures because there is a lot this week, but I keep saying I'm going to put them in, in the um in the. I'm going to put them in there. I am. I'm going to do that. You guys give me a couple of days. I'm still on vacation, but I'm headed home soon. So, um, so I will write down all those scriptures for you all. I'll just tell you what they are. Okay. And if you want to write, if you want to put them in your prayer binder, in case you don't have it, then you will. So the first one's first Corinthians 13, four and seven. The next one is Titus two, four through five. The next one is first Peters three, one through two. The next one is first Corinthians seven through 16. The next one is Proverbs 31 and 11. The next one is Proverbs 16 and 3. The next one is Proverbs 16 and 7. The next one is Proverbs 4, 6 and 8. Then there's Proverbs uh, 4, 25 through 26. And then Proverbs 2 and 16. Proverbs 3 and 25 through 26. And then Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. And it says here, 
Um, these are the other verses that led a mother, a parent to their children before the Lord and their protection in his hands. Pray for them all. And those are for the children. It says Proverbs 14 and 26, Isaiah 8 and 18, Psalm 78 and 6 through 8, 3 John 4, Ephesians 4 and 29, Colossians 4 and 6, 1 Peter 4, 7 through 9, and Romans 14 and 9, and 1 Peter 3 and 9. It says, homes and families, marriages and children can all too easily devolve into combat zones, which was the last thing in the world you ever foresaw when you pledged your life to your husband at the wedding altar, when you brought home the bundle of joy from the delivery room. What I'm telling you is this, you may not be able to control all the discord and unwise choices that occur in the various corners of your house or among the people you share a family with, but you can make sure that the only place you engage in combat and as the heaven lies in prayers in secret, the enemy who's intent on disrupting the peace in your home doesn't flinch when you try to force your own fixes upon it. But he does um, start worrying when a mother, a wife, a daughter, or a sister starts avoiding the, no the noise and starts making some noise of her own right outside the door to the devil's workshop. And I urge you for the sake of your family, take the fight into your prayer room rather than in your living room. Rip out one of those pages in the back of the book or grab your own stash of memo paper or sticky notes. Write down what you want to be. Be sure your enemy hears and praying. Use the biblical promises and passages from this chapter as a framework to get started. Then take your vocal pleas to God instead of making the vocal presence such a common fixture around the house. Get ready to go to war for your family and get ready to see some changes you've never seen before. Amen. So this is really good, you guys. I definitely encourage you because your family is worth it. Your children is worth the however long it takes you to get prepared and begin this fight. I'm just going to say a quick prayer over you all. So I just pray in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray. Even as we know the enemy um, tries to come in and to steal, kill, and destroy, Father, I pray that you would just even touch them touch us Lord God on this week let us begin to know and see the devil let us begin to call him out let us from this day forward never begin to fight with our husbands our children but begin to take that thing in prayer take it before the Lord and call out and expose the devil father we, we plead the blood of Jesus over everybody that's watching we pray Lord God for their families we pray Lord God for things that are being stirred up even now and father we thank you for blessings we thank you that that you want us to be prosperous and we thank you for the things that you're going to do and where this book club is going and we just thank you and i thank you guys for for you all and i will see you all in the next video bye guys